And please, the Amer um, do you have any Americans in the room or not? Because in America, this would be the first floor, right? Which can be confusing, right? Yeah. If you, yeah. yeah the, that still confuses me. I actually lived in the US for 12 years. My wife's American. I still get confused. I still go to an American hotel and they'd be like, oh, you're in like, you know, room suite or something. And, you know, you take the stairs and you get out of the wrong place and it's just a, it's just a mess. Yeah. I guess it makes sense. That, I mean, call it the ground floor or first floor, zero, one, no? The best, actually, where I live in England is a shopping center. I'm just riffing, by the way, until we start. Um, and I love this shopping center because the shopping center has two stories. So it has a ground floor and a first floor, right? Or first and second if you're American. And it has two, an underground parking garage, right? Of basically, I guess, a minus one and a minus two. So what they did was they called it lower shopping, upper shopping, lower parking, upper parking, right? And I have a really cute video. I can play it if you want. And they have this glass lift or elevator in the middle that you can get in. And I have this video. I completely staged it. And my son, he's about four years old at the time, he gets in and he wants to go up because he wants to go up to the toy store. And he goes into the elevator and he pushes the up button and it goes down to upper parking. And he's like, Dad, no, no. I completely staged it. I mean, I, he's, he has never forgiven me because I punked him. But, and it's wonderful. You can go there now. Literally, you can just go there and just like sit there. But like there's a coffee shop, you can have a coffee and a pastry and just watch people getting in and go, you know, what's going on? I pushed it. And the, and the hardest bit about it is that they have the word up in braille. Right, so if you are visually impaired, right, and go in and you don't know the kind of layout of this thing, right, and you, it just blows my mind. Anyway, I can, I'm quite happy to play you the video. It's called the Brook Shopping Centre. It's completely... Just, just a piece of design. But what I love about that is how many, how many people did a, that decision go past before anybody said, you know what, kind of like the Emperor's New Clothes. This is kind of silly. Maybe we should just call it like one, two, minus one, minus two. You know, all the way through to the lift engineer who was putting the little braille pins on, on the elevator that goes down when you push up. A minute and a half to go. Boom. You guys all had lunch, yeah? I miss lunch. Why? Because I, I joined the, 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 the lunch line or the lunch queue and it was just like huge. And it was like being at a theme park, like a Disney park. Every time I thought I would get to the front, I was like, ah, you know, it was just a nightmare. And then finally when I got to the front, I realized I had to present. So I'd, I came in here. So my diet today has basically been two coffees and a pastry. So, yeah, which is like, damn. Food of Champions. So if I end up speaking too quickly or rambling or something like that, because, um, you know, I know a lot of Europeans and, you know, to just, just slow me down, right? Just hit, 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 hit the brake pedal. And um, excellent. Thank you for coming, sir. I'm not picking on you. You've got that look of like, he's picking on me, he's picking on me. <laughs> I'm not picking on you, please. I'm not. I'm just very happy that, that you're all here. Wow, and I'm even happy that I'm here. So here we go, boom, so should we, should we start? We have about 40 minutes, which is awesome. So for those of you who are expecting Louisa, we've already gone over this once, right? Louisa isn't, I'm not Louisa. Uh, Louisa wanted to come to, Louisa Sears wanted to come to the conference. She's a colleague of mine um, who I work with at IBM. And it was her, um, she, uh, she got um, a master's degree and she just graduated and her parents put lots of pressure on her to basically go to graduation today. So today she's doing the kind of like student thing, you know, throwing her hat in the air, mortarboard, anyway, I think it's a mortarboard, you know, and having her parents, you know, because they paid for her education. So she had this big dilemma of like, you know, anyway, so she, she, she made the right choice to basically uh, to be with her parents, but she's kind of frustrated because she's not here. Um, and I've asked, so how is integration testing in hybrid cloud possible? Um, Cool, so I kind of have this story arc of, that I'm going to talk about today. Um, I'm going to talk about me, because right, yes, <laughs> lock the doors. You have to hear a little bit about me, um, and a little bit about the company I work for, which is called IBM. Um, a little bit about uh, software testing, okay? This is kind of my story arc I'm going to throw to you today. And then towards, at some point, hopefully before I run out of time, I'm going to introduce you to... Uh, um, and a Linux Foundation project called Galassa, which is really what I'm here to basically chat to you about, okay? 
And the reason that that's a question is because I don't have all of the answers to how is integration testing possible. It's a very difficult problem. And I'm very happy. I don't know what you guys feel when you come to a conference like Linux One and stuff, um, so, sorry, um, like we are today. There's a lot of great material being given by some really great presenters. Um, um, but there's also a lot of really just interesting conversations that just occur, some kind of in corridors and hallways and coffee lines. So the kind of, we can have one of those in this room if we want to. I'm really happy to just broker a really good conversation. I come here to learn as much as I come to sort of preach. That sounds like some really pompous sort of Julius Caesar quote, isn't it? Maybe it's not, maybe I'm mixing my metaphors. Anyway, so if you guys have a question or you guys just go, you know what, I can see something that you can't see, just just hit me with it and hopefully by the end you will. And thank you so much for coming and giving up your time. So let's talk a little bit about me. Um, this is my workplace. Um, I feel really privileged. I work for IBM in a, in a, in a place called Hursley um, in Hampshire in England, in the United Kingdom. I used to end that sentence saying in, in Europe, but, uh, but Brexit occurred. So, but, but it's still very much part of the European continent. This is a wonderful old building. It's been a hub of innovation for many, many years for IBM. It's quite old. It's a little bit older than IBM. IBM is about a 110-year-old company, International Business Machines, it stands for. It started off making cheese graters, of all things, and weighing scales, and especially making hardware. Um, and um, this is a picture of me. Um, this is what I like to do in my day. I like to just to prove I work there, I sort of exercise and work out with some friends in the morning and just do, do stupid, stupid kind of middle-aged stuff. Um, and, I, and I drink lots of coffee. Um, and uh, the other, apart from relaxing, I also am very fortunate that I get to work on um, this machine here. Does anybody know what this machine is or not? No? It's an IBM Z16. It's a mainframe. Oh, we, we, yeah, you called it mainframe. Okay, so traditionally they are... They, they, they've grown up from mainframes, and I'll touch on this later. Um, so some people call them mainframes, right? It's either a badge of honor, or it's, it's kind of like a slur, you know, you're old, you know, you're, you know, you should be dead, you belong in the kind of Jurassic era or something. Um, this is one that they take to conferences so it's plexiglass open, so it's not a fully loaded. If you plugged it in, it wouldn't actually work. Right? A few lights might blink or something like that. But I'm also what's called an open mainframe project ambassador. So my personal background is I've been involved with open source technology almost all of my IT career. The first project I got involved with was Java. Are there Java developers in the room? Yeah, go Java, yeah. I was there. You can actually scan for the source code in Java. I'm the only non-person who used to work for Sun, whose name was, I used to work in J2S. Anyway, we can geek out about Java later. Anyway, so um, I am, um, um, anyway, so I love open source. It's kind of in my blood um, and I'm, what's called an Open Mainframe Project Ambassador. The Open Mainframe Project, just a little bit of history, um, the Linux Foundation has like a gazillion, gazoogillion projects under it, but it has kind of a, a little bit of a structure, right? So if you look at CNCF, Cloud Native Computing Foundation, you know, they bring together kind of, you know, Kubernetes and Helm and the things that make interesting around that. And all of the open source projects on the IBM Z platform, mainframe, as you, as you call it just now, I'll call it mainframe, we're amongst friends. As an IBM, I'm always told, don't call it mainframe because then like, you know, the press starts throwing rocks at you for being old. Um, but um, it's called the Open Mainframe Project, and there's about nine different projects. And I'm going to talk about one, a new one today, Galas. So coming back, a little bit of history about the mainframe. If you Google for the word mainframe, you probably find about half of your image hits will be in black and white, right? And this is one that you'll find. And the, the legacy or the history of the IBM C16 did start with what's called a mainframe computer, um, the System 360 which uh, is, I think, created 65 years ago on April the 7th. Don't ask me how I remember that weird bit of nerdy tech. Um, anyway, that's it. Ah, it's full of tape drives. Anybody ever work on one of these or not? Has anybody in the room ever had to use a reel-to-reel -reel tape drive? I'm just like, I feel like I'm so old in this, this audience. I'm like, hey, Grandpa. I saw something earlier where somebody was punking the audience about like a phone. I actually, I failed my first audit because I had one of these lying, um, rather than it being stacked, lying in this sort of orientation. 
under my desk, and I was being audited on some software I'd written, and I prepared for this audit really, really hard back in the days of like ISO standards. And I remember the auditor coming around and he was like, have you got specifications for this program? Have you got sign-off? Have you got, I mean, it was kind of ridiculous days of the kind of 1980s, you know. Has it been signed in red ink? Because if you sign it in black, it could be a photocopier. I literally predate color photocopiers. Um, and I was like, yeah, I finally got through. Anybody here been through a software audit? Anyway, it's quite a painful thing. If you do. And finally, this person, he was he really, I was just a little punky 23-year-old in the room. He really wanted to fail me. I had one of these lying. And apparently, if you don't stack it like this and you lay it, eventually, over kind of geological time, the tape will actually slide off, right? And it kind of turns into, you know, like when you're a little kid and you have those things and you punch it through and you can create like little uh, kind of pyramidal triangles or sort of uh, cone shapes. And th that was an audit failure, right? Because in 12 years' time, that or something like that, I remember. Did you ever fail an audit or not? Do you, you pass all of yours with flying colours? Maybe you, maybe, maybe, you, maybe you are an auditor. You just like don't trash talk auditors, right? We're the good guys. Okay, cool. So let's fast forward a little bit. Um, so 1991, technology writer Stuart Allsop wrote, "I predict the last mainframe will be unplugged on the 15th of March 1996." And it wasn't a bad prediction, based upon everything that Stuart wrote. A lot of companies basically planned for that. Uh, a lot of really interesting disruptive tech came in, you know, probably, I suppose, PCs and, you know, uh, connectivity through the internet and this kind of very sort of distributed kind of hybrid world came in. That probably, um, but most IBMers basically like to say, in 2002, he admitted he was wrong. And um, there's actually a picture of him eating, eating it. Now, why did the mainframe survive? Why do people still use it? And I'm just going to play a cute little video, okay? And this cute video came out in 2002, okay? So, let me see. The room's completely empty. What was stolen? Everything. 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 Payroll, R&D, customer records. Assets. All of the assets. How could they get everything? How do I know? You're the cops. I said, look, pal, we're the only friends you've got. How much money are we talking? A lot. Millions. 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 All the assets Millions. were in this room? Ned, the servers. They stole all our servers. No, we moved everything onto that one. It's going to save us a bundle. I sent out an email. IBM servers running Linux. What's a server? Good infrastructure. It can save you a bundle. I just love it, and I'm sorry for giving that kind of like, without buying a sponsorship slot here, giving a clearly obvious matter. But there's something so cute about that, something just never age. I, I, I love it. But, but, the, but the thing that really saved the, the mainframe platform, so it used to run all these bizarre proprietary operating systems called ZVM and TPF, and uh, it still runs one called ZOS, it's actually extremely successful, and still is. But 2002, they ran Linux, right? Linux got ported to the mainframe. Absolute game changer, right? Um, and the machines that I work on today, they're called IBM Z60. I love it, it's all very end of days, right? Calling it Z, right? You can, you can come up with, an, IBM creates a machine called P for power, right? You can create the X, you know, you can create the Y, but it's already got the Z, the Z. Like what's, what, so somebody else comes along and they go, I've got a machine that's better and it's faster. What are you going to call it, Z++? Or you're going to call it like, you know, Z24, like Windows 95, that all kind of looks cool when it's next year, but... It kind of looks like a sort of aged relic when you look at it through the lens of history. So I, I, I have to thank the, the really clever, clever men and women in marketing who came up with that. It's not a mainframe anymore. So mainframe is kind of like it used to be a big thing. It's the mainframe. You can buy it in a rack model. Anyway, I'm not here to sell it to you. You can buy one that is completely dedicated to run Linux. And does anybody have any questions on mainframes or not? No. Okay. But it's what I do. I work on them and IBM. And they're still... Now, interestingly, if... I actually got this off a t-shirt, and I had to zoom in a little bit. Um, and it's sort of basically true. Um, every time, so it, they're used a lot by financial institutions. They're used a lot by banks, right? All the customers I work with, they're basically banks. Every time you buy, like, did anybody buy coffee from that little coffee cart outside or something? I bought one. Anyway, cool. So when you, when you do your payment, it probably goes through about seven different IBM Z machines on, on, on the way to come. I can go through loads of other infrastructure. It's this massive example of a hybrid cloud information. The, the scariest thing about it is that they do hold um, 
70% of the, uh, the world's business data is actually held on mainframes. You have a separate device called a DS8000, which stores it. Um, what could I say that kind of makes mainframes cooler than, than what they were? Um, they never crash. They never go down. They have eight nines uptime, so there's about three milliseconds a year unplanned outages. Um, they're very eco-friendly, so they're getting an interesting lift now because if you think about that beautiful, like the heist, and we stole all the servers and stuff, you just have less carbon footprint, less energy costs to, to, to run them and stuff. And the, one of the coolest things about the mainframes is, and I, I was just Googling around earlier, just because I kind of threw this presentation together literally just before I came in here, so I, but the paint's still a bit wet on it. Um, so and I found this um, blog. I wanted to find a quote about somebody saying that something written uh, 50 or 65 years ago still ran. They're, they were insanely backward compatible. And this was um, Michael Gatt, and I found, and um, it's fairly recent, what, that's July, isn't it? Seventh month. Anyway, he's at AWS Public Cloud, and he basically says, the, whatever you've written always runs, and that's why banks rely on it, right? So we have to deliver something where a piece of software that was written 50, 40, 50, 30, I just invented a new word there. I kind of, my, my brain just sort of fused 30 and 40 there. Um, unfortunately, it didn't come out of something really rude. Um, but anyway, it still runs today, and that's a good thing, and that's a bad thing. Okay. Any questions on that? Or are you all thinking, why on earth is Joe doing this? Okay. So let's go and talk about testing. So where I work um, in IBM, there is a shed load of testing. One of the things, everybody makes mistakes. Everybody writes bugs, right? And you can do shift left testing is the whole way that the more earlier you can find defects in the development lifecycle, the cheaper they are to fix, right? But if you have a defect in production, it can basically just, just, just trash your entire brand, right? Can, business will, will be sunk, right, by a defect in production sometimes, or else people have to be woken up in the middle of the night and things like that, and log on and stuff. So the one thing that IBM has managed to do over the last 65 years is it's managed to create an incredible archive of software that can test all of the different configurations about whether you compiled something 50 years ago with some sort of 8-bit compiler or whether you just uh, wrote it in some you know, non-compiled language, maybe like you shot a Python or something like that. Um, maybe you wrote it last week with a 64-bit compiler, right? And all of those things can work, and all of those things can interact and talk to each other, because whenever IBM releases software to its customers, the nightmare scenario that would just kill IBM as a, as a company is that if, if it crashed, right? If, if it took down, and I can't name who IBM customers are because of confidentiality, but basically every bank that you walk past is going to be an IBM customer using IBM Z in their infrastructure, or something similar. Okay, so within IBM, there's a job role called a QA engineer. Are there any testers in the room? Is everybody here engine? I should have done a you tester. Okay, cool. I should have done a little bit of a profile. How many folks here work for vendors, software vendors? Arms are all stay down. Okay, how many work for customers, like, but, you know, like a retail chain or a bank or a financial company? Well, the hands go high when you say, work for, okay, that's cool. Okay, so work for banks. Okay, so um, um, and it, and it developers who feel like there's testing by developers versus Q engineers. So IBM has a specific role, and now one of the, everybody wants to automate testing, right? So most um, who was the Java developer in the room, right? I, I remembered I, I'm old enough to remember when JUnit first came out, right? And I just remember there's a few pivotal things I've seen in my life, right? Like you know the first time I saw a, a, a GUI, a graphical user interface. You know, it was like the very first um, Apple computer. And I, I was like, wow, this is insane. This is going to be a game changer, right? And, and it was, right? First time I saw an iPhone, right? It's a, we all have those moments. I remember the first time I saw JUnit Framework. I thought, this is ridiculous, right, in the language. And, we, you know, we've got Jest. We've got lots of other frameworks like that. But the fact that you can script unit tests in the same language that you're authoring and then basically create that test suite, just insane. I love it, right? And it's great. And it meant that you would have an insurance policy that meant you could, you could become more agile. You would have more trust that the software that you're going to release is not going to break the system, right? And you wouldn't have to do manual tests, right? Um, so within the mainframe, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about testing now. So my, my thought process is kind of slightly out of sync with my, my slides. I'm like a drummer who's kind of like just, just got out beaten with the singer. Okay. Do folks know what the testing pyramid is or not? Okay, you do. We've got some nods. 
So I'll just claim credit, these two wonderful people much smarter than myself could basically claim credit. So unit tests, like you know, the J units, the sort of um, you know, jests and mocker.js, you know, they're all very specific for a particular language, so the author in that language can test something in that language, and then you create those software bundles and you know that the, that API contract won't regress. And that means you can be more agile, you don't have to be an incumbent in that technology to understand it, you don't have this huge steep gradient about learning it. You can just you can just come in, fly out, make a fix and go back. And you have these kind of like polyglot developers, right? So what you don't want is you don't want to basically get a career being a COBOL developer and then retire being one, or even a Java or whatever, right? You're much more valuable if you can move around different software projects within your company. Um, you know, because, you know, the, the, the telescope's always moving, right? Um, the more integration you have ultimately goes higher up. Now, what's interesting is, so this is a survey that um, was done by IBM, but it's published and you can read it if you want. Um, most IBM, most customers, um, when they get to the end, the very end of the road, and they're about to deploy something into production, they rely on manual tests, right? That's four-fifths of customers. Um, one particular bank, one particular very large Scottish bank, um, they have a day that they call D-Day. They release their software into production once a year, right? Okay, this is 2024, I'm talking about, right? And they basically spend months and months preparing for it. They've worked out the perfect day when there isn't like Black Friday or like, you know, some you know, a big IPO release or something like that, you know, that's going to, you know, the perfect day when their systems are the, the quietest they could possibly be, um, all leave is cancelled, right, and everybody basically, um, you know, stays, stays up all night, fingers crossed that it works, and they've rehearsed it, right? That's not very agile, okay? Um, and I won't say who that bank is, because some of you might bank with that customer. Um, but that's a bad thing, right? And that's one of the, it's also one of the reasons why people will leave a platform, right? If, you're, if you can't do agile development, if you can't do well componentized development with, you know, interlocking modules that you've got confidence, right, you're just going to be left behind, right? You know, if you're trying to bring your sort of company that's, you know, was, was king of the hill into everything with mobile payments and just blah, 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 and all this way cool stuff that's coming along with AI or, you know, speech-driven interfaces and stuff like that, and you can't keep up because if you release your software every year, you know, the, the people that can release it every four weeks or... Anybody from Spotify here? I always look at, you know, Spotify. I mean, they release their, how often they release their software. It's, it's insane, right, the, the regression testing. that These kind of new, new companies born, you know, this side of the millennium, you know, Netflix and stuff, you know. One of the reasons they're so successful is if you look at their CRCD and look at their automated testing is they just do it well. And if you invest in that well, and invest in that first, build that infrastructure, then you can basically get some really, really smart people to actually go. I, so I always think, and I'm... I, I said I wasn't going to be preaching, I'm going to be preaching. Invest in CI, CD, invest in Agile, invest in technology and infrastructure to make sure it's also Agile, and also invest in designers, being able to go really good use cases, you know, understanding your user scenario, right? People watch videos of Steve Jobs and things like that. Understand the use case, understand the pain points and how you're going to solve it. And then you can fiddle out what tech you can throw in the middle. A lot of people go, yeah, let's throw, that. Let's throw tech, let's grab a bit of this, a bit of that, and just throw it on the pot together and, and taste it and see how it feels, right? But invest in those two ends of the the spectrum. Okay, cool. So it's a big challenge for IBM and IBM's customers. Now, I, I was going to... And the, the, the particular Scottish bank I'm talking about, um, they basically hold their test results in a spreadsheet. They literally have a giant binder of, of, of things and people literally type in values and hit PF keys and do things like that. Um, it's, it's, just a, it's just bad. It's bad, right? The world is bad. Okay, so system testing. You said you're a tester, by the way. Are only system testers or integration testers or not who literally get paid to do nothing other than drive an application until it breaks? Using, no, they're not, okay. Because a smart thing to do, and one of the reasons that JUnit was first created, JUnit was created by Eric Gamma and Kent Beck as well as part of Agile and Extreme Programming, right? It's because Java developers don't want to <laughs> test up, right? Your job, if you're empowered as a developer, you can, you can just write a test framework in your same language, right? It just makes you more agile. Um, okay, so next thing I'm going to get to, anybody got any more questions apart from this one, which is why am I at an open source conference talking to you about <laughs> proprietary architecture called IBM Mainframe? So, so back in, uh, in Hursley, in that beautiful building, let me keep a track on time. I think I have 40 minutes to talk to you, or do I only have half an hour? 40 minutes. Wow, okay, cool. Um, and you ha I haven't got a single question yet. You're welcome to ask me questions, by the way. Um, so, um, 
there was a very large customer back in probably about 12 years ago, came to IBM, came to that beautiful building and, you know, they wined and dined and told us, because they're just about to sign some stupid, like, you know, $20 million, what we call, uh, IBM, we call it ELA, Enterprise License Agreement, IBM's biggest customers, they basically sign those. It's basically an all-you-can-eat buffet menu for whatever IBM <laughs> software has. They can just go, you know what, I'm just going to deploy that, 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 and just don't invoice me separately. You know, I'm big enough and I'm rich enough. So I, I, I want that kind of, like, um, you know, golden ticket. Um, and this particular customer was about to leave IBM, just, just walk away from the entire IBM brand. Something, something bad had happened, right? Or maybe another vendor had come in and said, you know what, we can do it at a hundredth of the cost or something like that. Um, and uh, uh, there was a female vice president at the time, um, and um, I'm, I, don't want to be, I can't make comments about diversity because I'm obviously a bald white male, but I really, really enjoy it when I see female vice presidents, when I see female executives, and I look at the way that they can, they are the real agents of change in, in, in everywhere. So I'm saying that as a pro-diversity thing, right? I really, I really love female vice presidents in the way that all of the disruptive things I've seen in my life, I can generally trace back to a female in the boardroom doing that. So if you need directors in the, in the room interviewing new people for their boardroom, you wouldn't be in my session anyway, but, but please, please try and get as many women and get as much diversity as you can in the boardroom. It just, it just basically livens up the discussion. And it gives you that extra sort of input, that extra kind of color palette of, um, uh, you know, of life experiences. So um, she, got, she got really, really mad and she stood up. I was in the meeting, I was quite junior at the time. And she said, I want to see how you, you as in we, as in us, me, I, IBM, um, how do you test your software? How do you make sure that everything that you, how do you underwrite the fact that you can deliver new software and basically not balk the world economy? Um, that wasn't her word, that's a strange British word. Bork, does, does bork translate? People know what bork means? It basically, okay. Was that, a, was that a yes or no? I think bork is like, is she Finnish? She was like a, a, a singer, maybe she's, I don't wanna, no, she's not Finnish. Is she Swedish? Iceland. Iceland, she's from Iceland. Iceland is a nice land. I, but who's been to Iceland or not? Did you enjoy it there? Did you go to the Blue Lagoon? Oh, that's insane. It's talk about life imitates art. The Blue Lagoon, it's this absolutely marvellous thing. It's, I love it. So it's basically like, you know, when life gives you le lemons, make lemonade. So when you go there, it's this kind of, it's a sort of really hot, warm, steamy water, very, very rich in cobalt. So basalt is an igneous rock, which is non-permeable. So if, you know, rainwater hits basalt, the puddle just stays forever, right, until it evaporates. Um, so that what they've basically got is they've got a, th uh, um, a power plant and downhill from that, they've got all this sort of a hot wastewater that just collected in a bunch of basalt and started steaming. And people just, you know, probably a bunch of hippies or somewhere, they wanted to go somewhere quiet to smoke weed and not get arrested. They just ended up congregating there. And then some, some really smart sort of business person said, why don't we start selling tickets? So you show up to this place and it's great, it's absolutely gorgeous. You know, they give you incredible food and you can sit there drinking beer out of plastic cups and smoking, you can rub yourself in this kind of cupboard. Was this, did you have the same experience? Yeah, and it's this amazing, I mean, it's talking about what do you do with, and is it, there's an episode of The Simpsons where they basically talk about how to basically monetize like a pool of radioactive waste, and you, you basically go to Iceland. And I'm not, because I'm sure it's very, very safe. I'm sure the health and safety inspectors go there a lot. Um, why did I start talking about that? Anyway, so she said, I want to know what you have done. And... Um, and she basically said, and she was literally yelling in the room. It was quite fun, actually. Um, and it was quite funny. So we, we, everybody in the room sort of stood up and we walked, and me and a colleague of mine, and she said, I want to see how you test your software. We walked around that beautiful old historic building to other bits of the IBM lab. There's 2,000 people there, you know, and the carpets get a little bit shabbier, and maybe the light bulbs are flickering, you know, and the kind of smell isn't quite as sweet. Um, you know, and things like that, and bins are overflowing and stuff. And we got to the system test lab, and it really, it really was something, you know. And basically, that was where, you know, the worker bees were doing system testing. And they explained to her, and the entire rest of the, of the week was basically, they had to basically pitch camp from the beautiful sort of like, you know, you know catered ballroom that we, that we had for her to basically the system tap. And she said, I want that, and I want it, I want you to make it free, um, so I don't want to buy it. And I also wanted to make it so that it's not specifically owned by IBM, right? So that you can encourage other vendors to come into that ecosystem. Um, and, um, and that's how it started.
That's 12 years ago. Sometimes that's called eating your own dog food. Um, um, IBM, we like to call it drinking our own champagne, which is that wonderful, beautiful kind of glass half full spin on it. But we're basically eating our own dog food. Cool. Which brings me up to the project that's called Galassa, which took 12 years to create. And most of those 12 years were basically just making sure that weird bits of proprietary stuff were taken out. Right? I don't know if, any, if anybody, has anybody here, here ever had to like take something that was a proprietary project and then open source that project or kind of open wash it? It's, a, it's quite a lengthy process to do, right? Like starting open source projects like sort of de novo from scratch, and I've done those before, I think is generally slightly easier, right? But if you take something that's proprietary, because you go, oh, well, actually, and then the, the lawyers and people, you know, software archivists start digging around. They go, oh, we got this thing here with this package. Oh, we can't use that anymore. Or, oh, we were given this by a customer. Um, so what's interesting is one of the things about this software, I'm going to pause now because I'm talking to you. Does anybody have any questions on what I said so far or not? Did you lose the customer? Yet? Sorry? Did, you lose the Did we lose the customer? No. 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 <laughs> That's a good, st um, this is being televised, and I have to be really careful because there's all sorts of proprietary information. I think it's quite a secret company as well. Um, no, 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 they're now, uh, I think they're now IBM's third or fourth biggest client. And they're a US based bank, and we're not claiming credit for it, but they've grown their market share and, they've, and they survived the financial crash of um, you know, 2008 and 2012 really very, very well, and they've acquired two other banks since. Which probably means you can reverse engineer in Google and figure out who they are. So forget I ever said that. Um, but yes, so that's a good story. Yeah. And um, yeah. And she's retired now, that vice president. Yeah. But she's a, she's a phenomenal powerhouse. Um, cool. Okay. Deep integration testing. So this is a picture of the website called galassa.dev. Who is involved in open source naming in the room? Has anybody ever named an open source project? It's really freaking hard. It's an absolute nightmare. So the first thing we wanted to do was we wanted to call it, I don't know why I'm telling this stuff, I'm just goofing around. We wanted to call it VORAS, V-O-R-A-S. Now, first of all, we wanted to call it based upon, so the term software bug, legend has it, I don't know if it's true or false, is that you know, back in the day when you know, um, you know, hardware was actually physically you know, relays and we didn't have you know, transistors and things like that to basically create our logic gates, um, you know, a moth crawled in you know, to a relay, and then it tried to sort of shut, it polarized, tried to shut, the moth was in the way, you know, the moth wasn't conducted material, and basically there was a defect in the program, and when they figured out and disassembled it, they found the moth. And I think legend has it that, that you can actually go to the Smithsonian Museum in Washington, D.C., and you can actually see a moth pinned, but half the internet thinks that that's fake, and the other half thinks it's true, yeah, and the other half can't, can't count, so threw that one out there. No, it wasn't, anyway, I thought it was funny when my brain was processing that information, but, but it might not be. So we wanted to call it, so the word in, we wanted to call it Voras, which I think is Czech for moth or something. Anybody from the Czech Republic anyway? Maybe it's not Czech for moth. Anyway, but, but it's some Eastern European language, maybe it's Hungarian for moth. We thought that'd be so cool, Voras. But it turned out Voras had already been trademarked and the lawyers are really pissed off because they'd spent loads and loads of money doing like an IP search, right? Um, and then we wanted to call it um, another word that was to do with a spider because we realized that spiders at moss and then that word was already trademarked and it was just too weird anyway and we ended up finally settling on Galassa. I think we just could anagram some things um, so it's called Galassa. Um, so definitely some hybrid, I had hybrid in the title um, anything derived from heterogeneous sources or composed of elements of different or incongruous signs. So one of the reasons that people still use the IBM D platform in this particular bank for example None of their customers log on to a mainframe. Just, just none of them. They're all using mobile payments. They're all outside buying cups of coffee and all sorts of things like that. The amount of tech, the technology stack that you have engaged in, in, in that, the amount of form factors you have driving input. Um, so typically, when I talk about the seven mainframes that you might do when you do a payment, some of those are just basically just like, I'll just move some money between accounts. But you've got other payment, you've got payment providers you have to talk to. You have to put money in flight. You have to put money on queues. You have to, um, fraud, de fraud detection is really, really important right now. So you have to make sure, is that customer really the right customer? Is that vendor really the right vendor? Has there been some sort of attack or compromise that's occurring? And you might be looking at things like, well, you might geolocate that customer and go, well, they've never, they've never, they've never been to this country before. They've never bought anything like this before. So you have lots of AI scoring engines and all sorts of, there's a boatload of stuff involved. There's a shed load of moving parts involved. And that's really the challenge of, of how do you, of, of, of testing. And that's what we try and do with Galassa. Okay. 
Has anybody else got anything they want to inject about hybrid or hybrid computing? Or for me, it's no. I mean, it's just, and it's 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 not in any position of stasis. There is constantly stuff coming in flight all the time with that. It's a very very moving target, right? And the challenges of testing. This is one of Louisa's slides. So just have a look. My slides are the ones with silly pictures and videos to distract you from the fact. Um, so um, basically. Um, how do I test the whole as well as individual components? Which is really, really interesting. So sometimes, if you look at, if you take a framework, I don't know, like, the, the folks know what I mean by unit testing or, or, or JUnit, or, right? So you're basically just testing the API interface of a, of a, a, a something in an SDK, a software development kit in a particular language, and say, well, this thing is a public method, and it kind of asserts that, that if I pass in this data, it's going to return this data. And you're basically just asserting that over time. So you're sort of black box testing that. But a lot of testing that we need to do, because if you think about how you're testing an application, it might shift, it might dump stuff on a queue to, to somebody else, right? You, you might be putting stuff on, a, you know, some, might be using Kafka, you might be using MQ or something like that. So your testing needs to be like, well, now I'm going to test, now I'm going to simulate making a transaction on a mobile payment device. And my assertion that this occurred is because it, I see something in a log. I see something in the queue. So you're binding together some user interface testing, some UI testing, perhaps using Selenium or some framework like that, with your assertion is basically just, just many bits of the technology stack removed from you, right? So you're not, you're not asserting that, yeah, the user got a little like thumbs up that that worked. That, that, is, that is not testing, right? You're, that, you know, when you're testing something, there's a wonderful, and I wish if I ever do this talk again, I'll try and do the diagram, which is when you create a piece of software, you know, if you just basically get the specification for the software and just test it for the specification of the software, you're basically wasting your time because you assume that the, that the developer or the development team that gave you the software, it already meets the spec. What you're looking for is you're looking for where it doesn't meet the spec that it met, which is also an interesting thing for hackers and attack vectors, right? Because they'll be like, oh, well, let's, let's, let's hit boundary conditions. Let's put like, um, you know, integers um, in, in fields, uh, you know, characters in fields that expect integers, right? Let's um, let's assume that you know. Let's throw um, you know different alphabets. Uh, you, you know, something that maybe it's only coded for U.S. English. Let's see if I can throw a Turkish uppercase I, which is a, a slightly strange UTF character, but something that's maybe um, pretending to be ASCII and, and trip it all up. So you're you're looking for those edge conditions, and the result of those will be that something else got. So you need to get your hand. You need to bind yourself around an incredibly different heterogeneous software set. Um, and you need to be that kind of polyglot of understanding and having all of those arms and legs to be able to reach into that entire landscape. Um, and you also have to be able to interact with legacy systems, 3270, 5250, those are basically the protocols for just green screen, except they're not green because you can have multicolored screens. Anyway, but it's those sort of terminal applications that you see, the oldy terminals and stuff. Basically, how do I connect to a boomer application at the back end and how do I connect to something that's sort of Gen Z? Stuff. Okay, that is the challenge. So I googled uh, while I was preparing for this um, hybrid architecture, and what's interesting is I thought there'd be one hybrid architecture. What's really cool? I was literally going through the Google Images. I thought, you know, let's let's like, let's let's put some incredibly sort of like colourful, distracting chart in, up here, and every I, 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 I could find Azure's. Um, you know, Microsoft's definition, I could find AWS's definition, I could find Google's definition, I could find... So it's, it's not even, there's not an, even an agreement, and even with all the wonderful open source uh, stuff that's going on right now, everybody's tilting you towards uh, some bit that they want you to be sticky uh, so that you're, 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 you're paying them, which you have to do, right? Open source is not free. I mean, open source is freeware, but there's been some really good talks here about how you have to, you, you have to monetize that, right? You have to... You want people to be sticky to your technology, but you also want to make it so that they don't feel that they're hostage to your technology, right? And getting that balance right. And you see, it's, again, it's a changing landscape. Somebody that is incredibly good at being kind of free might be acquired, right? And then sold by somebody who's actually very good at making you sticky and proprietary and basically. So you've always got to have that kind of exit door that says, you know, well, I can just move from one vendor to another. Right, or I can move from one stack to another. And you see it all the time with like some, so, you know, or somebody will get put top of the pops and then all of a sudden they just go, oh, and we're just going to change our license, right? And, and, and then what's interesting actually is there's a couple of really good cases uh, with um, 
Uh, yeah, then basically people go, well, we're just going to create a new fork and uh, nine days later something appears, which is quite good. So all those hedge fund managers and people that bought it are basically just have to, you know, the bet that they made didn't work, which is quite cool. Um, but basically, boatload of moving parts, incredibly heterogeneous landscape, incredibly heterogeneous stuff with this entire fossil record of like past to present to future, right? That's the challenge that you have to do for system testing. Any questions on hybrid? No, hybrid cloud? I've only had one question, and that was all about whether, whether IBM managed to give its customer or not. You can ask me any question, and you can also give input as well. I know I'm talking at tens of the dozen because I've had lots of coffee. Yes, sir, you have a question. Your hand went up. Have I got the word microfocus on that chart or not? So it's a good question, and so, yes, yeah, so uh, what a lot of customers will do was, so COBOL is a very um, popular language for mainframe tech, because it basically was, was, you know, it was, it was the apex predator in probably the 19, I'm not a COBOL historian anyway, probably, I think probably up until Java was created, I think Java basically just kicked, kicked COBOL off of, of, you know, off, off of the throne for the, for the business language. Um, so there's a boatload of stuff written in COBOL, right? And as you start to modernize a COBOL application, which is sometimes just called a, sometimes it's called a big fat application, or the F is sometimes, you know, replaced with other, other adjectives. Um, you, what you want to do is you want to modularize that. You want to create components of that, where right? it's just good, you know, to have that kind of low sharing force between software components that can evolve independently. Um, so you're basically going to end up creating sort of microservices and smaller modules. And what you'll find once you go on that path is some of those COBOL, I'm going way off topic here, but I just enjoy answering the question. Um, some of those modules will be bound towards, some of those modules will be more optimized to run on the IBM Z platform. They might make native calls, right? They might use native file systems and they might even have a bunch of assembler code or written in it, which, right, which you know, so they're sticky to the platform. And some of those you might refactor it and go, you know what? That module is actually just doing a bunch of, you know, data transformation, right? Okay, it can run anywhere. I can stick it anywhere. And if you've got a good API boundary and you've got things to be footloose, right? So the battle cry for Java was always right once run anywhere, right? And if you don't use JNI bindings and you don't make it platform bindings, and this is true with any people writing Linux drivers today, right? You, you, you should be able to pick that stuff and run it wherever you want to based upon whatever your business needs are, whatever your cost is, you know, you're introducing latency, um, you know, you might have, you know, and, and that's really that whole kind of like, you know, on-prem, big fat, you know, multi-million dollar IBM Z machine all the way through to just, you know, I've spun something up in the cloud. So what Microfocus do is they basically have a, a compiler that lets you take COBOL that's written for the IBM COBOL, which I think is like a GNU COBOL standard now. Um, and they let you basically compile that for other platforms for x86 and then stick that in containers and then run that in the cloud. Um, and then you can basically start using, you know, REST or sockets or whatever you want. And that's that they're very good at doing that. Yeah. I, I think open text, I think Microfocus doesn't exist anymore. I think they were bought by a company called Open Text. Um, I think IBM then started suing Open Text about some technology that may or may not have been sort of used outside of its license. People often say about IBM is um, IBM has good people working in technology, but it has even better lawyers. <laughs> so I'm not quite sure what the state of uh, of that lawsuit is, and I probably shouldn't even uh, mention it because I'm probably yeah. I think, I think my director was in court the other day. But then I think a company called Rocket Software bought open text. But that probably changed this morning, right? So good question, though. Does that make sense? Yeah. But I think you, what, you, what, you, what, you, what you hinted on there, and I may have sort of garbled in my reply, is this is a very changing landscape, right? So if you're a, if you're a bank and you bet the farm on this stuff, this is just a distraction. This is just noise. This is just basically just bugs in your windscreen, right? You don't want your testing framework to be so sticky to a particular technology that you can't meet these new requirements as you move it around. So just as you want your software to be footloose, right? Once deploy anywhere, run anywhere, you want your test testing architecture to be the same. Cool. I haven't run out of time. Have I run out of time? 
I have run out of time. I'm so sorry. Galassa is the project that solves that. I'm going to run to the end. It is an open source integration framework developed by IBMers. It's fully extensible. Um, it has other software vendors um, involved in it. And it was just open source. I'm just going to quickly get to the end. Because um, I can't believe I ran out of time. I've got a demo. I'm not going to do the demo now. Um, sorry about this. Um, the reason is going to kill me for this. Um, but this is it. So the, the, the project is called Galassa. Within Galassa, there are three sample applications which were actually donated by an airline, a bank, and an insurance company. Um, they had to be cleansed, data cleansed, so that from an intellectual property point of view, there was no way that you can identify. There was no IP from those three different vendors. We managed to open source one of them, which is called SimBank. It, is, it, it covers everything, um, and it also has mobile payments and stuff. And what, what basically the Galassa engine is, it's written in Java, just because Java's a good language to write it. It has a command line interface, it has REST APIs, and um, you can integrate it into the JUnit framework if you want to sort of code at that level. It basically lets you peek and poke and push and you know, sort of tickle and look at an entire ecosystem. Um, IBM provides infrastructure in the IBM cloud uh, for different servers you can spin up. Um, you can mock up bits of it, but the best thing, you're just about to deploy something in production, so you don't really want to use mock data, or you want to use obscure data. Um, and the project meets, and let me get to the end. So that's the basic thing. So the challenge of the project is 80% of all enterprise testing is currently manual. We want to bring that number down. IBM's tasty dog food, then it is open source software. Um, it's currently being used, so during that 12 year period, we were open source it, and it was being adopted by that very large uh, US bank where that incredible SVP managed to basically kick IBM and make IBM open source it. Lots of banks in UK, lots of banks in Europe are using it. Um, so during that period, there was a kind of like closed, closed beta program for it. It's currently fully open sourced under EPL2. And if anybody wants to join us, us, we, Louisa, because she's not here, I didn't work directly on this project. Um, just, just let us know what's going on, right? Um, right, because we really just want to make this thing successful, right? Um, basically, so that so that people can have, yeah, just just not have to not have to get call outs on weekends when things break, or be reticent for delivering software on sort of agile release cycles for their employers, right? Because both of those two are just bad things, yeah. And that's it. And I'm sorry I overran and goofed up the end of my bit. Um, sorry about that.